Hi, I'm Gary and welcome back to my channel, Gary Does Solar. Now not everyone has an electrical or electronics background and when you enter the world of solar there are so many new terms to learn and it's easy to get confused by it all. I mean what is the difference between kilowatts and kilowatt hours? To help out then I thought I'd make this short video to demystify these terms in just a few minutes. And even if you already have a good understanding of the relationship between power and energy, it's worth sticking around anyway as I cover some other stuff. Shall we get stuck in? Kilowatts and kilowatt hours then. You'll see kilowatts written on many electrical appliances you own, and you'll see kilowatt hours on your monthly electricity bill. But what do these terms mean? Let's start with kilowatts. Kilowatts is a measure of power, and power is the rate at which work is done. Power is measured in a unit called watts, named after James Watt, who developed the concept of horsepower. A kilowatt is 1,000 watts, in the same way that a kilogram is 1,000 grams, or a kilobyte of memory is 1,000 bytes. Kilowatts are generally used in preference to watts when talking about energy in the home, as many larger appliances use more than a thousand watts of power. Looking at kilowatt hours then, this is a measure of energy, which means the amount of work done. And these two terms are related. Energy is equal to power multiplied by time. And because of the hours in kilowatt hours, Time is generally expressed in hours as opposed to minutes or seconds. So we can think of energy as simply a level of power being applied over a certain number of hours. It's easier to see this relationship between power and energy with an example. Here are two people about to race each other, lifting heavy boxes using a rope. The first person will pull with a certain amount of power but the second person will pull with double that amount of power. OK, let's start the race. On your marks, get set, go. As you might imagine then, the second person wins this race easily. It only took them three seconds, while the first person took six seconds. But here's the thing, although the second person put in twice the amount of power, both people still expelled the same amount of energy. This is because energy is equal to power multiplied by time. If you double the power, you halve the time. With this in mind, let's see how power and energy work with electrical appliances. Let's take a kettle holding two litres of water and having a power rating of three kilowatts. If the water is cold and we switch on the kettle, we can expect it to take around four minutes to boil. In order to work out the amount of energy required to boil those two litres of water, we must convert the time into hours. There are 60 minutes in an hour, so 4 minutes is 1 15th of an hour, 60 divided by 4. Now we can work out the energy required using our little formula from earlier. We multiply the power, 3 kilowatts, by the time taken in hours, 1 15th, to get 0 0.2 kilowatt hours. Let's now consider a kettle that is only 2 kilowatts. The time taken to boil is longer, now 6 minutes, which when we convert to hours is 1 10th of an hour. The energy then is one tenth of the power, which works out as 0 0.2 kilowatt hours. We shouldn't be surprised that the energy is the same as for the three kilowatt kettle, because that is the energy required to boil two litres of water, no matter what the power of the kettle is. Let's go a bit further now and look at the amount of energy each kettle uses over a year. Let's assume an average of six boils a day. That works out to 2,190 boils over the course of a year. We can work out the annual energy requirement to cover that, which is that number multiplied by 0.2 to get 438 kilowatt hours. We can now work out the cost. In the UK, a kilowatt hour of electricity is soon to be around 40 pence, but you can substitute this value for the cost of the country you live in. This gives a total cost of just over 172 pounds for the year. That's quite a lot of money for just one appliance. And maybe here is where an obvious saving can be made. If you're only making two or three cups of coffee or tea every time you boil the kettle, then by not filling up every time could save you nearly £100 a year. OK, let's look at another common electrical appliance then, the electric light bulb. And actually, we'll look at two types of bulb, an LED bulb, which is the most common type of bulb in use today, 
and an older type of bulb called an incandescent bulb, which many of you still might be using in some of the rooms of your home. An LED bulb typically has a power rating of 14 watts, which will produce the same amount of light as a 100 watt incandescent bulb. If we assume each bulb is used for an average of, let's say, 8 hours a day, that works out at 2,920 hours per year. With this, we can work out the total amount of energy required for each bulb over the year. Remembering that energy is power multiplied by time, for the LED bulb, this is 14 watts times 2,920, which works out to 40.9 kilowatt hours. We do the same for the incandescent bulb, 100 watts times 2,920, which is a whopping 292 kilowatt hours. We can then work out the cost of powering each bulb over the year as follows. 40.9 kilowatt hours times 40p equals £16.36 for the LED bulb, and 292 kilowatt hours times 40p equals £116.80 for the incandescent bulb. Crikey, that's for just one bulb. It's worth checking around your house then, just to make sure you've replaced all of your incandescent bulbs with LED ones. OK, let's take a look now at the power requirements for a variety of consumer appliances in your home. We've already seen that a kettle runs at 2 to 3 kilowatts. A hairdryer is roughly equivalent. A microwave is typically less than 1 kilowatt. But a clothes dryer comes in at a whopping 4 to 7 kilowatts. At 40 pence per kilowatt hour, that's almost three pounds per hour to operate that machine. There are a few ways to find out how much your own appliances use. The first is a device like this one, which you can buy online for about 20 to 30 pounds. Let's say you want to know just how much power your clothes dryer actually uses. The device is very easy to use. Just unplug the appliance you want to test, plug in the monitoring device, and then plug the appliance back in on top. Next, check the device is in the correct mode by repeatedly pressing the function button until the screen shows kilowatts. You're ready now to perform the test. Simply switch on the appliance and read the power value from the screen. In this example, the power is nearly 5 kilowatts. Now for some appliances, it might be difficult to access the socket where they're plugged in, or those appliances might be directly connected to the grid supply, for example, an oven or a hob. You can still measure the power consumption of those appliances, however, if you have an in-home display unit like this one. This device is normally supplied to you whenever you get a smart meter fitted. If you don't have an in-home display, either because you don't have a smart meter, or like me, you've simply lost it, you can use one of these older style units instead. These units come with what is called a CT, or current transformer clamp, that fits around the incoming supply line in the electricity meter box, and sends readings wirelessly every 10 seconds or so to the display unit. Getting hold of one of these units can be tricky though, as they are not easily available new. But if you look on websites like eBay or Facebook Marketplace, you can generally pick them up for around 20 to 30 pounds. Both types of device tell you how much power your home is consuming at that very moment. And so to measure the power for any particular device, just do the following. First, make sure the appliance is currently switched off, and then wait until the reading on the unit is stable. That is, the display is showing the same value for around 20 seconds. Note down that value as we'll need it in a moment. Then, switch on the appliance and wait another 10 seconds or so, and you should see the reading on the display go higher. Note down this new value as well. Now, the difference in these two values will be the power consumed by the appliance you're measuring. In our example here, the clothes dryer is consuming just under 5 kilowatts of power. Now, it might be that other appliances switch on and off while you're making your measurement, for example, a fridge or a freezer, so you may need to repeat this exercise two or three times to get an accurate answer. Finally, for certain appliances, it's more complicated to monitor their power consumption. A dishwasher or washing machine will consume varying amounts of power depending on what part of the cycle it's in. And a fridge or a freezer is only consuming power at certain times of the day. To find out the power consumption of these types of appliances, we'll need to take a slightly different approach, using the first monitoring device we talked about earlier. We'll first need to put that device into a different mode. Press the function button a few times until the display shows kilowatt hours. Now if the display already shows some numbers from a previous time it was used, just use a pen or a cocktail stick to press the little reset button in the middle, and this will reset all the numbers back to zero. 
you're now ready to start measuring the energy used by your appliance over a few days. And note this time we're measuring energy in kilowatt hours instead of power, kilowatts. Just use your appliance as you normally would over the next few days or even weeks and the monitoring device will count the days and also the kilowatt hours of electricity consumed during that time. In our example here, the energy consumed by this fridge freezer over one month is just over 15 kilowatt hours, which works out to almost half a kilowatt hour every day. Just on a side, if you're getting a lot out of my videos, please could you hit the like button so that YouTube will recommend the videos to others. And if you subscribe, you'll always be the first to see what new content I'm working on. Thank you. Okay, now that we have a good understanding about power and energy, let's have a look at how all this relates to your own solar and battery setup. For this, we'll use an example solar array of 15 panels. Each panel can produce 400 watts of power in direct sunlight, so 15 panels will produce 6 kilowatts. Actually, we usually refer to this value as kilowatts peak, as this is peak output. On less sunny days, the output will be less. This array is connected to a string inverter, which is in turn connected to the main circuit in the house, as is the national grid supply. In our example, we'll have three appliances connected to the main circuit, a kettle, a toaster and a washing machine. On a bright sunny day in summer, the array might generate six kilowatts of power, but not all six kilowatts will make it into the main circuit. And this is because the inverter here is rated for a maximum of five kilowatts the other kilowatt of power is simply lost. So what appliances can we power with the five kilowatts available? We can switch the kettle on, which requires three kilowatts, and the remaining two kilowatts of power that we're generating from the inverter is simply exported out to the grid. We can also switch on the toaster, which requires two kilowatts. That's a total power consumption of five kilowatts now, which matches the output of the inverter. And as a result, no power is exported to the grid anymore. But what if we now switch on the washing machine? All three appliances will work, but as there's not enough power coming from the inverter, the extra two and a half kilowatts required will have to come from the grid. Okay, let's switch all the appliances off again and add in a battery to the installation. Note that battery sizes are measured in kilowatt hours, not kilowatts. This is because batteries store energy, not power. This particular battery can store up to 8 kilowatt hours of energy. It's also a DC coupled battery, which means it connects directly to a special kind of inverter called a hybrid inverter. Let's say that the solar array is only producing 2 kilowatts of power now because it is cloudy. If we're not using any of the appliances at the moment, all 2 kilowatts of that power will go into the battery, charging it up. Let's suppose now that the solar production increases to 4 kilowatts we can expect all four kilowatts to go into the, wait, what? We can actually only charge this particular battery at a rate of two and a half kilowatts. And you'll find that different batteries have different charging rates. At a rate of two and a half kilowatts charge, if the battery is empty, remembering that energy equals power multiplied by time, we can work out it will take just over three hours to charge. Okay, later, when the sun has gone down, we have no generation from the array. If we switch on the kettle, we can see that the power to the kettle is being supplied by the battery, but not all the power it needs, only 2.5 kilowatts. This is because this battery also has a limit to the rate of discharge, in this case 2.5 kilowatts. The remaining half kilowatt of power is provided by the grid. You can check the data sheet for your own battery to see what the charge and discharge rates are. Now I mentioned earlier that the battery we're using here is a DC coupled battery. One of the great benefits of this type of battery is this. Let's suppose the solar generation is at its peak of six kilowatts again. As before, the inverter can only output a maximum of five kilowatts into the main circuit. The remaining one kilowatt was lost before, but now with a DC coupled battery, that one kilowatt can be used to charge the battery instead. Okay, let's now change this DC coupled battery for an AC coupled one. This particular battery is a Tesla Powerwall, which can hold 13 and a half kilowatt hours worth of energy. Let's switch on all three appliances. The power requirement then is seven and a half kilowatts. But let's say there is only three kilowatts of solar generation at that time. The inverter is able to supply three kilowatts to the main circuit, but there's still four and a half kilowatts to find. 
Luckily, the Tesla Powerwall has a discharge rate of 5 kilowatts, so can easily meet that requirement. If the Powerwall is full, we can calculate how long it will last. By rearranging our energy formula, time equals energy divided by power. So 13.5 divided by 4.5 is exactly 3 hours. Not bad at all. Thanks for staying with me. Hopefully now you've not only got a good grasp of power and energy, but also how these relate to your own solar setup. Just before we go, if you'd like to support the work on this channel and you live in the UK, here's my referral code for Octopus Energy. I'm going to be making a video all about them shortly, as I think they're leading the way for us all to have a clean energy future. Until then, thank you for watching.